Without further ado, let me introduce today's speakers. Joe Slowick is a principal advisory hunter at Dragos. Finding, tracking, and defeating ICS-focused malicious actors is his job and passion. Prior to his time at Dragos, Joe, Joe ran the incident response team at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and he also served as an information warfare officer in the U.S. Navy. Our second speaker is Otis Alexander. He is a cybersecurity engineer from MITRE. He leads the development of the ICS attack model and focuses on the categorization and emulation of adversary behavior in cyber physical systems. Otis holds a BS and an MS in computer science from the University of Washington. Now I'm gonna hold, hand the uh, webinar over to Otis to begin. All right, um, thank you all for uh, coming to hear about Attack for ICS and why be we believe it's important. Um, I'm so happy to see so many people uh, are interested in Attack. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dragos for inviting me to speak today. Um, and I think most importantly, I'd like to thank them for being a valuable contributor to Attack for ICS. So what is MITRE? Um, MITRE is a not-for-profit corporation that works in the public interest. Uh, MITRE is dedicated to solving problems for a safer world. Uh, this includes um, uh, helping to protect the world's most critical infrastructures. Uh, so we're exposed to a lot of work in the ICS arena uh, through our government sponsors, including the DOD and DHS, as well as other agencies and our private partnerships. So one of the big impacts that MITRE has had over the last six years and um, that we've centered on uh, is our work to pioneer uh, better ways to create, share, and use uh, threat intelligence. Uh, and this is exemplified in the mass adoption of the MITRE attack knowledge base. Uh, the attack knowledge base is used as a foundation for the development of specific threat models and methodologies in the private sector in government and in the cybersecurity product and security uh, service community. This work highlights just one way that MITRE is fulfilling its mission to solve problems for a safer world. And a natural extension, I think at least to the people in the ICS community is a complementary knowledge base that focuses on the ICS technology domain. Uh, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So <clears throat> after Many years of work, I'm very happy to announce Attack for ICS is open uh, and available to the public. Um, so if you haven't had the chance to already look at it, please go visit the site, uh, attack.meyer.org um, slash ICS. And also we released a blog post uh, at the same time to kind of help get you oriented and to answer some common questions that you have. I'll pass it to Joe. Okay, thanks Otis. So just to do an introduction for what is Dragos. So Dragos is a industrial control system focused security company. There are three components to Dragos. First and primarily being the Dragos platform, a dedicated direct detection and uh, operator response technology designed specifically for industrial environments. Supporting that we have Dragos Worldview, our threat intelligence service, which is where I sit, uh, which is also an ideal place from which to support the minor ICS attack efforts since this is where we gain knowledge about what the current threat landscape is and what adversaries are doing and what the expected future landscape might turn out to be. And then supporting all of this, a professional services offering, including incident response, threat hunting, and threat assessment services. So with that, I'll pass it back over to Otis to take us through the, our agenda and the initial parts of what the attack framework is. So here's our agenda. Uh, we'll be talking about the purpose and function of attack. Uh, what's our motivation behind creating attack for ICS? And then we'll go over some applications and um, use cases for you. Uh, and then we'll go over conceptualizing ICS threats and then future considerations. <clears throat> so what is attack? Uh, to state it simply, attack is a knowledge base of adversary behavior. 
Uh, it's based on real world observations. So we try not to include every proof of concept attack out there, but instead focus on what adversaries are doing in the wild and what red teamers are doing that are likely to be picked up in, um, by adversaries in the future. It's free and it's open. So anyone across the globe can access it. And this is in line with our working in the public interest. It's a common language and it provides us with a mechanism to all get on the same page and talking about adversary behavior. And I think most importantly, and given you know, how many people are on the call, I think it's important to state this, it's community driven. So we rely on you to tell us what you're seeing, what you're aware of, what's affecting you. Um, of course, we don't have all the answers, so we rely on the input from the community to make attack better for everyone. So we usually include David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain uh, in, in our talks. And uh, for one thing, it's a, it's a good categoriz categorization of IOCs. Um, and it also helps to show what our focus is uh, in terms of attack. Uh, so we want to highlight that it's uh, difficult for adversaries to change their TTPs or behavior, and that's why we focus on them. Uh, and it's especially difficult for them to change it in relationship to the other ILCs listed in the uh, pyramid. There we go. So. Let's break down attack really quick. So if you're not familiar with attack, uh, please visit attack.meyer.org and take a look at the different matrices and some of the resources available there to get yourself oriented with attack in general. Um, I'll quickly go over some of the major concepts associated with attack right here. Um, so this is the technique matrix for enterprise attack. Um, if you look across the top, uh, you'll see tactic categories. Uh, these tactics represent the adversary's technical goals. Uh, this can be the goal of gaining initial access or moving laterally through the environment. Associated uh, with tactics are techniques. Uh, techniques are how um, the adversary achieves um, their goal. And then uh, what we can do is we can look at a particular uh, technique associated with initial access, spear fishing attachments. Um, what this is, is it shows us uh, the procedure um, of the TTP, and it's a specific technique uh, implementation. So we can understand how a group or a particular adversary actually implements this particular um, technique. So this helps us to uh, gain a better knowledge of adversary behavior. And the key components here are tactics across the top, techniques associated with tactics and procedures or the implementation of techniques within technique pages. So attack covers a number of technology domains, including Windows, Linux, Android, as well as other um, domains that um, are, are highlighted. Uh, so what's the motivation for an attack for ICS? Well, looking at the attacks against ICS over the years, we've seen some unique adversary goals, uh, taking in consideration the purpose of ICS, specifically uh, to control industrial processes, it's clear that adversaries and mainstream attacks have tried and have been successful in causing impacts to these processes. Um, they have accomplished these impacts through the strategic manipulation of process control and have enabled uh, these attacks or made them worse by inhibiting uh, response functions such as preventing operator in intervention or disabling safety and protection systems. Uh, these types of goals in this specific context is out of the scope of the other attack knowledge of bases. So that's one key motivation for attack for ICS. There are also uh, technology differences, uh, specialized embedded platforms, applications and protocols, all used in concert to monitor and control industrial processes. So we have to take these into consideration and we need to look at how adversaries affect these key pieces of technology. 
And in terms of defense, we need to make sure we have the ability to collect and analyze the proper data. Uh, many of the capability offerings to defenders in this area are immature in this respect. And last, uh, when we think about adding defenses to these environments, we wanna make sure they don't conflict with safety or availability. Uh, so these are some of the key motivations behind creating an attack for ICS. So attack for enterprise and attack for ICS can be used in concert to map uh, adversary behavior across the entire business. Uh, attack for enterprise can highlight how the adversary moves through the IT conduit to OT and attack for um, ICS can explain how the adversary stages their attack and ultimately impacts the industrial process. So we can use both of the knowledge bases together to explain a wide range of adversary behavior across the entire business. So when we map incidents at MITRE, we first map them using the enterprise knowledge base. We then take what's left over and we map it to attack for ICS. Uh, there's some overlap in many cases, so we sometimes include Windows techniques that are associated with the later stages of an attack within the attack for ICS knowledge base, but we in general try to focus on the unique things that adversaries are doing. Uh, if you take a look at the blog post that I posted earlier, it'll highlight some of the cases in which this happens. So this is the uh, uh, attack for ICS technique matrix. Um, just like the other knowledge bases, it's a way for us to visualize uh, tactic and technique relationships. Um, so the matrix can be broken up into three distinct parts that I'll go over now. So the first, um, portion, what I have highlighted in terms of tactics and techniques represents the work adversaries may perform to gain access to ICS. And this can be from the internet or it could be from uh, a, the enterprise network, a, a third party vendor connection, uh, any uh, connection you have into the system uh, that could be utilized. It also highlights some of the work that the adversary does to find and target um, particular systems of interest uh, and collect information about the, the process that's running or how well they're doing in um, staging their attack. But ultimately, this is the work that comes before um, the actual attack. So these two uh, tactic categories inhibit response function and pair uh, process control uh, really highlight what adversaries are doing to affect the uh, uh, control system. Um, so they may <clears throat> have to get certain systems out of the way, such as protection systems or safety systems, or they may need to hide certain things from an operator or prevent them from uh, stepping in to correct uh, a bad situation. And then empiric um, process control is direct actions that kind of drive the process into a bad state. And then last, the impact. Uh, this is um, what the adversary seeks to actually create. It's the actual effects that they're targeting. So all of these uh, stages are important and we try to highlight this within Attack for ICS. So how do we build Attack for ICS? Um, sorry about that. Going crazy, Joe. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so how do we uh, build attack for ICS? How can you map your threat intel to it? And how can you figure out if you have a new technique or uh, to share with us? Uh, so this is a breakdown of the process of mapping to attack. Uh, and hopefully it can help you. This is what we use in order to map it to attack internally. Uh, so this can be used in several ways, as I stated before. If you have your own threat intel uh, that you like to map independently, you can use this process. If you want to validate our mappings, you can use this process. If you believe that you found a new behavior that you'd like to submit, you can use this process to see if it's already covered in attack. Um, so what's involved in this process? The steps are kind of laid out, but let's take a quick uh, look at each step. So 
first, uh, we need to kind of find a behavior. Um, so here, what we have is a particular incident report. Um, we have an excerpt of a paragraph from that incident report, and it highlights some uh, behaviors of an adversary. So um, the first one is uh, talking about COM ports being opened uh, to prevent other processes from accessing them. And then uh, the act of uh, a particular payload component uh, taking over and maintaining control over RTU device. So this is an uh, excerpt from Industrial. It's talking about um, the 101 payload component. We kind of start to think about what tactics and techniques may be associated with these particular behaviors. So <clears throat> something that we want to do is uh, get familiar with this behavior, especially if we're not already uh, familiar with uh, serial com or anything like that. So researching it can help. In general, uh, this can involve a number of different activities. Uh, one of the activities could be a red team, blue team exercise in which you emulate the behavior and try to defend against it. Or you can utilize external resources like we have here to get a better understanding of it. Um, so for this particular instance, you could uh, play with an RTU or serial ethernet converter to better understand what this behavior looks like and what you can do to stop this from happening or detect that it is happening in your environment. Um, it's also fairly easy to check out resources such as the one that we have here. Um, this is just a Linux document um, that addresses troubleshooting uh, steps that you can take or things that uh, could potentially go wrong with serial connections. And we kind of identify what could go wrong, what are the error messages associated with it, uh, and get a better understanding of what it looks like when the device is locked out or a device or resource is busy. So the next step uh, to translate in uh, this behavior uh, is to translate it into a tactic. Uh, this involves understanding uh, the adversary's ultimate goal or what they're ultimately trying to accomplish. So for an analyst, it may not be immediately apparent uh, why the adversary is trying to conduct a particular action. Um, some domain expertise may be necessary to understand the role of serial com in the ICS environment. It may also be necessary to understand the criticality and purpose of a particular communication path. So in terms of choices, uh, once you've done your research, Attack for ICS has 11 options available to you for uh, tactic mapping. So in this case, looking at these particular uh, behaviors, we can kind of hone in on a couple of things. Uh, connections made to prevent access, uh, to prevent access to serial com, and um, the, also the behavior to cause an inability to maintain control of RTU. And we kind of map that to a tactic. So the first one we're mapping to inhibit response function because we're preventing a response to a particular action and uh, the ability to maintain or control uh, an RTU uh, falls under impact. So the next and last step is to figure out which technique applies to these behaviors. Um, so you can take a look at the techniques associated with the tactics uh, by looking at the technique matrix. Uh, and we can identify um, based on the tactics that um, we identified in a previous slide uh, a, a set of techniques that may apply uh, to this and we can kind of narrow it down. We can also do a keyword search uh, to find an associated technique that we can map to. So in this case, we maybe look for um, serial or serial com. We could also look for um, block communications or anything like that to kind of get an idea of what uh, techniques kind of apply to this behavior. Uh, so from our mapping for this paragraph uh, within this uh, incident report, we found three tactics and techniques that apply. Uh, first, in terms of blocking of the serial com, we have inhibit response function, which is block serial com. We have inhibit uh, response function and block uh, command message, so it prevents an operator or something from um, controlling uh, down to like a substation or something like that. And then um, for the 
portion that is take over and maintain control of the RTU, we have impact uh, and the technique is denial of control. So we can quickly start to uh, map uh, behaviors to attack uh, by going through this process. And this is something that you can do as well for all the use cases that I mentioned uh, previously. So if you have a full incident report, um, you could potentially map to the uh, technique matrix all the particular techniques that uh, you found that are associated with behaviors. And uh, this is a very important uh, use case for us, uh, and it's something that we do often. So this particular mapping is notional, but it illustrates what you could potentially come up with after mapping the incident. So this helps us to look at coverage and concentration of techniques to identify high use tactics and techniques. And one thing that you can do is you can uh, overlay multiple incidents over each other to get a better idea of uh, what techniques uh, different adversaries are using um, over multiple incidents. And we can kind of identify patterns across multiple incidents by doing it that way. So how can we use this information to assess your coverage of these techniques? Uh, in general, uh, these mappings can be used to help identify defensive gaps, uh, overlaps in coverage between uh, products. It can also serve as an overall means of prioritizing defenses. So what you see here is uh, sort of a heat map. Uh, we kind of moved away from um, the, the red, yellow, green, you're covering something, and thinking more of uh, a, a spectrum of uh, coverage. So we may be more confident in areas than we are in others. Uh, but this is just one use case that we can uh, utilize in order to get a better understanding of our stance or how well we're doing in terms of defensive coverage. Um, there's more use cases for attack for ICS that we don't have time to cover here, but we plan on releasing more material over the next couple of months to highlight these additional use cases. So with that, I'll hand it over to Joe. <clears throat> Thanks, Otis. So we've talked a lot about the underlying methodology of attack, how ICS attack has been built out, and other details for the framework. Uh, Otis had just gone through some examples looking at the 2016 Ukraine event of how you can start extracting different ideas for um, you know, how to map events that have occurred in the real world to the framework, but let's try and dive into applications in terms of actual threat behaviors, what that means for defensive purposes, and then start getting into future considerations. So first and foremost, we really want to use ICS attack and attack in general as a mechanism to formalize or systematize a way of identifying adversary methodology. You can overlay this on top one of your kill chains, since we have more than one kill chain, uh, as an sort of a uh, combined organizing principle between the specific techniques and tactics within attack and then the different stages of the intrusion life cycle. But for brevity's sake, we're really just going to talk about some initial access methodologies specific to ICS, move into more of the uh, begin to act within the network, so intrusion, reconnaissance, control, onto ICS attack delivery execution and leading into the actual uh, industrial impact. So from an ICS access perspective, we are already presuming an ability to access the ICS network, which means in many cases that an intrusion aligning with enterprise attack has already taken place, thus showing the points of uh, connectivity or at least transition between the enterprise attack framework focused largely on enterprise IT infrastructure, then transitioning into an industrial specific intrusion that then is all and able to gain access to ICS resources. What's interesting here is that we start getting some interesting uh, options for how that access works in terms of technologies in play. So certainly we have things like VPNs and RDP, but we also have remote management software like TeamViewer, as well as the possibility of having beaconing implants or uh, depending upon network architecture, other mechanisms of getting into networks and techniques are applicable for a given network are important to keep in mind because it highlights different measures that can be taken or that are needed to um, 
undertake in order to either cut off certain attack pathways or identifying what residual risk is left within the environment. Because at the end of the day, any adversary trying to get into a control system network to do something, whether that's just merely building up access, collecting information, or trying to build up to a disruptive attack of some sort, is they need to ensure that that access is sustained, persistent, so that implants can be communicated with, access can be restored at a moment of the actor's choosing, etc. And ICS attack allows us a way of visualizing this both for specific threat actors as well as overlaying what specific weaknesses, vulnerabilities, or other items are applicable to the network that we're defending. Now, moving away from the initial access portion, we start getting into the actual intrusion portion of the attacker lifecycle, looking for lateral movement within the ICS environment. Do we have an adversary that is simply reusing credentials and remotely logging on or something perhaps even more exotic and interesting, such as weaponized project files that are used as a means of propagating access through the environment like was seen in the Stuxnet event? So looking for different types of code execution, defense evasion, and other techniques are in play in order to make that intrusion begin to bear fruit. Part of that being reconnaissance of the system in question. So depending upon the network, depending upon the industrial industry vertical, there are still lots of questions that an attacker would need to answer once they get within a industrial network for to, to determine what sort of steps are necessary to take next, what steps are applicable, and which ones are simply ruled right out. So this includes what devices are in the network, what firmware and software revisions are they running, uh, what is the architecture to the extent that you can identify what are the important communications paths to key network resources. So unless you want to be very noisy, which we've observed some adversaries, again, going back to the two Ukraine events being fairly noisy in terms of scanning and enumeration activity, they still likely require some degree of long-term access and a mechanism to collect and then ship data out of the network so that an adversary can review it and analyze it. Finally, to enable all of this to happen and kind of going back to the idea of access is the ability to maintain control. So it's not just sustaining access to the ICS environment, but being able to carve out or maintain network and communication pathways that allow an adversary to execute all these steps because they have positive control over malware in the environment. There are certainly exceptions to this that get a little interesting, like when we talk, start talking about warmable or self-propagating malware, which might lack a significant amount of uh, well-defined control or limitations on activity. But even in these realms, we've seen this within control system attacks, again, going back to the Stuxnet event, where wormhole malware can be designed to be very specific, both in terms of what systems it's looking for and where actions on objectives will be executed. And all of these considerations and these finer details can be mapped to the attack framework as a way of categorizing what an actor or what an attack is, to use attack in multiple different ways in the same sentence, my apologies, but there's different ways of categorizing what the activity we're observing is, how it meshes with the broader threat landscape, and then what is applicable or what is most concerning for our own environment. Now getting into the more uh, concerning aspects of the attack landscape, and this is where ICS attack both shows its value as a separate construct as well as why it must be a separate construct because when we start talking about delivery execution and soon impact, we start getting into different categories of uh, activity and the art of the possible, so to speak, that differentiate ICS networks from enterprise IT. So while certain aspects like gaining access to uh, certain hosts of interest, like say an Active Directory controller enterprise IT, may be superficially similar to getting access to say a data historian in a control system environment, there's a lot of process specific nuance that gets lost in simply carving uh, this out as accessing key network terrain because access to different parts parts of the network architecture enables the adversary to execute different process-based uh, effects depending upon what it is that they're trying to achieve. Furthermore, identifying those uh, disruption possibilities are really environmentally based. So in looking at you know, what sort of impacts we can achieve within an environment and how that attack has to be built and delivered, that we're really starting to talk about lots of process-specific and even vendor and firmware-specific uh, build and capabilities that both are non-trivial to develop and also feature a significant amount of overhead in terms of developing and deploying and might not be necessarily reusable, which gets into one aspect where attack straddles the line, so to speak, between being 
quite general to allow for a great amount of flexibility while also enabling a certain amount of specificity so that we can start getting actionable, usable uh, recommendations and visualizations of what's going on. So if you look at something like the Triton Trisis event from 2017, we had a type of malware that was very narrowly focused on a very specific type of controller and a very specific uh, firmware revision for that controller as well. Uh, as a result, it doesn't necessarily duplicate itself well into other environments, but from a attack categorization or classification uh, perspective, we can start looking at this as a manipulation of safety and other control characteristics that previously we hadn't observed and then allow us to fill out that attack architecture. And finally, one of the things that we really want to um, look at within a uh, ICS network is that going back to the idea of maintaining positive, somewhat direct control outside of uh, autonomous malware situations is you know, any effect that has to come in, whether you're launching something like uh, and destroy your crash override, Triton Trisis, uh, a future Shamoon variant to be determined, that it has to get into the network somehow, or you have to have an operator in place, like we saw with the 2015 Ukraine attacks, that can execute the actions on objectives. So how is this attack going to manifest itself and bring its way into the environment? Are you migrating code within, or are you enabling someone to interactively alter, uh, change, disrupt the system in question? Finally, what I think is the most significant aspect of the ICS attack framework is the conception of ICS specific impacts. So the enterprise attack framework introduced in last year, uh, IT specific impacts like data wiping, and uh, loss of availability, etc., which has some parallels with control system environments like we see availability come up and be you know, fairly important in a control system environment where you want processes to function, operations to continue, but availability is only one of several impacts and some of which have no clear analog in IT environments. So first off, we have control. So do you have uh, not just, you know, can you control the process in question, but, you know, one question that differentiates availability from control is that it's one thing to be able to start a process, you want to be able to do that, but do I really want to start a process if I can't conclude that I can stop it if things are going poorly, which brings us to potentially, or in my opinion, the most important category of all is looking at impacts to safety. Because as we start talking about impacts in industrial environments, we start talking about that uh, junction between a logical system, a you know, series of computers or whatever, interacting with and controlling a physical process. As a result of that control over a physical process, manipulations on the IT or IT-facing level, the cyber level, have repercussions in reality, such as potentially inducing physical damage to equipment or even physical harm to operators and workers within that environment. So in looking at impacts, we want to make sure that we're also categorizing how imp uh, different attack types, how different intrusion pathways may impact safety because that offers not just a very important view into the risk presented by certain attack frameworks, but also strongly uh, influences what sort of mitigations are necessary or what our cost tolerance might be for certain mitigations, considering that a given technique or a given attack pathway may result in not just damage to equipment, but you know, potentially harming or even killing someone. Now, one issue that comes out with mapping ICS threats to attack and that uh, has been noted in other uh, presentations and by other researchers is that you know, it gets kind of hard because while we see lots of attempts and noise at you know, doing something ICS aware, and it's something that I run into a lot in my intelligence work with Dragos, and we see lots of scans and phishing and probing, but these are all essentially IT intrusions, IT actions that just have a little bit of ICS flair to them in terms of you know, desire and intentionality. But there's mercifully, uh, if you are an asset owner or an operator, very few examples of actual ICS attacks. You know, really less than 10 publicly speaking of which we're aware of going back to the late 2000s. So how do you build out a corpus of knowledge from this? And you know, this is a legitimate issue. And this was a point made by Marina Kartoffel in her Kaspersky ICS presentation a few months ago, uh, which we have a link in the resources section of this presentation of, you know, what do you do in those cases where, where you have few examples of filling out a way of categorizing a, you know, the ecosystem of potential attacks, but at the same time doing so, and this is a concern that we have at Dragos, not giving adversaries ideas, not um, providing them with inspiration for different mechanisms or different ways of uh, executing and actions on objectives. So the way that we look at this is that, you know, you could take 
you know, a typical backward looking approach where you have, uh, you know, typical defense development based upon detections and indicators. So we're completely dependent upon there being intrusions, getting us to the problem of there not being enough ICS incidents. In those cases, we would identify technical indicators, perform some analysis, build some detections and disseminate them, or at an even lower level, uh, identify indicators of compromise and disseminate those and use that to build up our corpus of knowledge. And you can do that but that puts us squarely into the position of being very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, develop a robust version of the attack framework for ICS. So this wasn't an approach that we used here, and I think Otis captured that quite uh, well when going through the industry or crash override example. So an alternative that we see in detection markets and you know, trying to go away from building out a corpus of uh, potential techniques like we see with an attack is, well, you could just try and identify weird because we're talking about presumably steady state systems here that have very narrow tolerances for operation. So in those cases, we would establish some normal, a baseline, collect data in order to identify deviations from that and then alert on the anomalies. That seems very simple in practice, except one consideration I usually like to throw in I spoke to this last year at RSA is uh, normal is not necessarily what you think it is and more importantly is that some of the instances where you want your equipment operating in the most autonomous uh, least supervised fashion is when normal is no longer established and you have to have sort of out of band or unexpected responses such as a safety system kicking in in order to interrupt something because it detected some anomaly uh, taking place in the network as opposed to responding via a security alarm but the other aspect is that while something might be anomalous, it doesn't necessarily mean it's suspicious. It could just mean that there is a variation in feedstock or that we had an especially cold morning for the service area which we're providing power to. But more importantly is that suspicious even doesn't necessarily equal malicious. And differentiating and uh, dispositioning each event that comes up as being anomalous requires someone to enter into the situation to do that differentiation to uh, figure out what's going on and that could lead to alert fatigue and being overwhelmed. So really the approach that attack takes and that allows us to sort of get away with not having that many examples and not trying to skirt the problem entirely by just going for a process anomaly specific approach is really just trying to understand threat behaviors. So determining from both a most general perspective and then using incidents to sort of fill out the margins, what are the fundamental requirements to compromise or impact ICS operations? What would any adversary entering into a industrial network uh, and potentially specific types of industrial network, depending upon how fine grain of detail you want to go into, uh, what are the necessary mechanisms that adversaries need to deploy in order to meet the requirements for ICS network access, ICS network control, and then the ability to deliver some effects on objective. Because then looking at what those commonalities are, what those uh, central behavioral pain points are that pretty much any adversary is going to need to figure out a way to overcome, whether that's communication, reconnaissance, attack development, uh, inducing impacts such as loss of denial or manipulation of view, control, or safety. Uh, that then forms the bedrock around we, which we can start building specific behavioral instantiations that fill out the attack matrix, even in the absence uh, necessarily of concrete examples to base them around. So this is where attack really helps us to start not just developing or spitballing what these sorts of things might be based upon what we observe in the wild and what adversaries may have been trying to accomplish, but it also allows us to start organizing this in a way that allows it to be useful, sustainable, and extensible into both detection and defensive planning efforts. So ultimately, while I talked a lot about threat behavior and some of the shortfalls of other areas, what we're really trying to shoot for and what attack allows us to fill in is looking at the four types of threat detection, which we've gone into before in uh, prior publications and presentations at Dragos, is uh, you really want to be doing all of these things more or less uh, very well. So you want to be doing some level of anomaly detection. You want to be doing some level of indicator tracking and alerting, but to fill in those areas where either indicators are impossible because you're talking about unique sort of network environments or modeling and configuration analysis becomes burdensome because you're buried in alerts on potential anomalous items. Threat behavior analytics as defined by and systematized by a way of looking at the threat landscape, such as through ICS attack, allows us to build up a robust mechanism to identify uh, and categorize not just known effects, but also net new attacks that still combine different elements that we've observed in past operations. Because uh, 
thankfully, adversaries, while concerning and certainly motivated to do bad things, are, at the end of the day, human beings like us all and, to some extent, intrinsically lazy. Thus, very few, if any, adversaries ever truly innovate across all types of the uh, kill chain or across all of the techniques that one might deploy in ICS environments. And by ensuring that we have coverage, as uh, shown earlier by Otis, and looking at the framework and mapping you know, from a threat intelligence perspective what is going on from what we're observing to observe techniques, that we can identify that, yeah, we might not either have coverage or even understand, uh, like, for example, going to the Triton Trisis example, you know, there was a theoretical knowledge that a safety system might be the subject of a cyber attack at some point in the future, but no one really expected it to happen until it did. But we had many other data points, many other touch points that could have been used in order to identify maybe not the final execution of objectives on the control system, but all of the prerequisites and the supporting elements within the control system environment that made that attack possible. And identifying those behaviors, building out or being aware of the need for detections allows us to then build up a robust threat detection approach. So where do we go from here? So attack is interesting because it's not static. It can't be. Instead, it requires a combination of continuous development, engagement with the community, and to ensure that we co-evolve with the adversaries within our environments. So from a continuous development technique, one of the most important aspects of uh, attack is that it cannot remain static. So we've had this webinar. There was the uh, public release next week. There'll be other talks and papers coming up in the near future. You know, attack has now been disseminated to the community, but in order for it to be useful, in order for it to be successful, is that the community has to identify how suitable is what's been released to operations and what needs to be added, what needs to be refined, what additional details and evidence need to be supported. Uh, there were some discussions even on Twitter the other day about certain adversary mappings that were uh, very insightful, both for revealing you know, certain uh, limitations or expectations on what sort of data needs to go into the framework in terms of evidence and support, uh, but also why certain decisions are made. And that sort of engagement is vital to make sure that we uh, arrive at a uh, relevant framework that is adaptable and meets the community's needs. Now, to do that, MITRE has done an excellent job, and I applaud them for this, is that attack, as Otis emphasized at the beginning of this presentation, uh, especially in terms of enterprise attack, is available to the community to interact with. So, um, fortunately, I forgot to put the URL here, but this is very easy to find, and we can certainly send this to you later on. But uh, attack allows for community contributions. So if you have a complaint, if there's something that you feel could be better with ICS attack, anyone can get involved. And Dragos was very fortunate to be one of the early members of helping to build out the attack framework. And I was very happy to work with Otis on this, but we were not alone. There were many other researchers, other organizations that were involved as well. And ICS attack as a tool, ICS attack as a framework around which we can structure defense and threat intelligence is only going to be as useful and as effective as we have individuals from that greater community of ICS asset owners, operators, and defenders contributing to it to make it better. Because the other part about this is that just as ICS attack can't remain static because it needs refinement to community needs, it also needs to be adaptable and evolve with adversaries because adversaries are going to continue to learn and refine what they do, thus targets and impacts can shift over time. If we're not co-evolving, moving our defensive frameworks and understanding along what uh, along with what adversaries are trying to do, whether that's migrating from you know, simple loss of availability like we saw in 2015 Ukraine to a potential protection system attack in 2016 Ukraine to a safety system focused disruption in 2017 Saudi Arabia. If we're not tracking these developments over time and how aggressive or how adversaries are shifting as time goes on. Attack as a tool is going to be not just uh, less than useful, but um, potentially useless after a while. So the flexibility, scalability, and again, that community involvement perspective are all very important to, to ensure that attack remains a viable and relevant tool moving forward. Now, this presentation covered a lot of the sort of high-level aspects of what attack is, Otis's background, and how to use the framework, as well as some mapping to ICS applications and the general threat environment. For those that are interested in some very specific examples, since we only had 45 minutes, an hour, uh, my colleague Austin Scott will be giving a presentation at the S4 conference next week, and he will map ICS incidents explicitly to the attack framework to provide very specific examples based upon what has happened in the last few years for how these events map to attack and what the significance of that is from both a uh, detection analysis and threat intelligence uh, perspective.